Welcome to chapter 13 of our Intro to Psychology course. This lecture is on social psychology, and social psychology really has to do with talking about parts of the human experience and specifically behaviors of people. Why do they act the way they do? A couple of questions um, that guide the first section of this chapter include why do people help others, meaning in areas of kindness, why are they kind, and why are people aggressive toward others? These are the kinds of questions that get answered in the first section of this chapter. So let's take a look at this. Um, we as humans are actually very interdependent, meaning our survival depends on the cooperation of you know us with others. So how does morality actually factor into this discussion of cooperation? All right. Morality. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg is the theorist that's associated most with morality and has a theory of stages to moral reasoning. Very similar to think about when we had Piaget's stages of cognitive development. Uh, Kohlberg has a stage theory as well, but to moral reasoning. And he focused on the why and the reasons that people give for a decision rather than the what or the decision itself. Okay. There are some limitations to this approach. And that is that a lot of times people make decisions, moral decisions, that is very quickly, intuitively and emotionally, they kind of don't give it much thought or logic. They don't apply logic trying to find out the why they're making that decision. They just make the decision often. All right. The other limitation is that um, most, it's assumed that all moral decisions are based on seeking justice and avoiding harm to others, whereas it's really not the case. Most of the people in the world tend to um, look at moral decisions in reference to how loyal they are to their particular group, uh, the respect that they have for authority, and maybe any sort of what we call spiritual purity, which has to do with kind of their religious beliefs as well. So it's really not that simple to say all moral decisions are based on, you know, justice and avoiding harm, because that's not necessarily the case, okay? Now, when we talk about, um, you know, as people, we often engage in what we call pro-social or altruistic behavior. Altruistic behavior is helping others without a benefit to ourselves. A very simple, straightforward definition. Why do we actually do this? And there are two reasons for this altruistic behavior. One, people in general want a reputation for being fair and helpful. And two, people who do cooperate punish those who don't. What that actually um, implies is a couple of things. Some of this behavior comes naturally and some of it is a result of some cultural influences that will make people be uh, kinder or altruistic to others and the other thing to think about is why do we help others even if they are not altruistic themselves um, that meaning those people actually will benefit because of us even though they are not altruistic themselves. These are just questions to think about when we think about people's behavior and uh, it's an interesting piece to keep in mind. Okay, Now this is a very interesting figure um, and this has to do with that altruistic behavior as well because as part of the altruistic behavior we have to look at the ideas of cooperation as well as the idea of competition. So in this figure, they call this the prisoner's dilemma, where there's two people involved and each person has an incentive to um, confess. People choose between a cooperative act and a competitive act that benefits themselves many a time, but actually ends up hurting others. So in this particular dilemma, we kind of look at these four squares, quadrants, and we take a look at what could happen. Um, the idea behind the prisoner's dilemma is that you and your partner have been arrested and charged with armed robbery. You are put into separate rooms and each of you is urged to confess. But here's what happens. There are lots of kind of scenarios of what could happen with you confessing and your partner confessing, neither of you confessing, one of you confessing, and here, here, here is how it's broken down. In the top left, in this blue quadrant, if you confess and your partner confesses, 
okay, so both of you are confessing, then each of you will receive five years of jail time, okay, an equal kind of split, all right, seems logical, uh, seems like something you might agree to, okay, if you move over to the uh, right column, if you confess, but your partner doesn't confess, okay, so you haven't protected, um, so, so you're, you confess thinking your partner might, and so, um, but they don't, then you receive zero years because you actually confessed, so you, they're going to let you off, and your partner doesn't confess, then your partner receives 20 years. So in reality, you've actually not, not sold them out, but in a way, your behavior didn't work, you know, in their favor. It worked in only your own favor. So you were thinking just about yourself. Um, down here in the bottom left, if you don't confess, um, yet your partner confesses, that's the reverse of what we just talked about in the upper right quadrant here. It's that your partner um, kind of sells you out and now you receive the 20 years and your partner doesn't because they confessed and were let off as a result of that confession, but they weren't necessarily thinking about you, okay? However, if you don't confess and your partner doesn't confess, then each of you will receive um, one year in prison. So it's interesting to see because if both people actually confess, which is the top, they suffer worse than if both had refused to confess, which is at the bottom. So you would see five years, each of you, if you both confessed, and only one year if both your partner and you don't confess. So this, this kind of really um, tries to demonstrate, you know, uh, or investigate how things work with cooperation and competition and thinking out for others or not thinking for others. Um, and that's an interesting kind of idea because this is part of cooperation versus competition, altruistic behavior, the behaviors of people. Okay. Um, why, why do we look around at others and say, okay, I'll do that. Like why, when we're in a situation do we agree to, let's say, help or not help, all right? And there's a couple of ideas here. The first one talks about bystander helpfulness and apathy, and there's two terms. The first one, diffusion of responsibility, is where we tend to feel less responsible um, when there's a lot of other people around and something's happening and we don't act because we feel like somebody else should be the one to act. So for example, if you and a group of people or a lots of people nearby are witnessing a crime, you're a witness to a crime, the question is, do you help or not help? Do you call the police or not call the police? And the idea behind diffusion of responsibility is that the more people that are around, let's say, that particular crime scene, the less likely every single person is to act because you, you often think, okay, um, you know, somebody else is going to call or somebody else is going to do something. All right. The other idea is called pluralistic ignorance. And this is where you look around at others and if they are not acting or reacting to a situation then and then it's the idea is that then doing nothing is probably acceptable as nobody else is doing anything, meaning nobody else probably has enough information to be able to evaluate the situation and decide, okay, I need to be doing something, all right? Um, that's what's called pluralistic ignorance. Another piece about, um, you know, deciding if I should be doing something or not is called social loafing. This is where we have a tendency to work less hard meaning we loaf a bit more when we're sharing the work with other people. Okay, so for example, if um, let's say in class of a class of 20 people in college, you're asked to write all the uses for a brick on a card, on an index card. If you're by yourself, you may tend to write kind of, um, you know, many things, all right? However, if you're asked to just kind of 
take your card and throw it into a pile with everybody else's card that was supposed to write it, you may write less ideas on there because the idea is, well, you know, other people's ideas are going to be in that pile too. So I don't really, really need to write that many. Okay. So most people are going to work less hard when they think they're part of the group versus when they, they work alone. Um, except, and here's the exception, it's when they think they can make some sort of unique contribution um, that others cannot, such as, let's say you're a specialist on a specific topic in a group, all right? Or the other exception is that they are evaluate, you think others are evaluating your contribution, such as when you play on a, a sports team. OK, the other teammates um, and the coach and everyone else is going to be evaluating, you know, what kind of contribution you are making to the team and, you know, their win, let's just say. OK, um, part of the human experience of kindness and altruism, which we just discussed, is just one part. All right. Another part is now called cruelty and violence. And there are some causes of anger and aggression, which are part of the cruelty and violence um, category. All right. There's a hypothesis called the frustration aggression hypothesis. And it's a theory um, in which it says that the main cause of anger and aggression is that there's something that's standing in the way um, of you doing something or you getting something. This is causing you frustration. And when it causes you frustration, it leads to anger, okay? This frustration or discomfort that we now have um, kind of will increase our probability for anger and aggression, especially if we think um, that others are causing us to feel this frustration intentionally. So let me give you an example. If someone is running down the hall and they bump into you, you may get angry, okay, um, and say, hey, you know, what the heck, man, why are you running into me? But if someone slips on a wet spot in the hallway and bumps into you, you probably aren't going to get as angry because it's not intentional, and you might actually say to that person, hey, oh, are you okay? Because they've now slipped and fallen. So it's, while the situation is similar in that they bumped into you both times, one time they were running down the hall and it seems more intentional, okay? So you get angry, whereas the other time they're slipping on a wet spot and you don't get as angry because it doesn't seem as intentional. So that's something to think about, all right? In addition, why, the question is why are some people aggressive more often than others? Why do, why do we see this aggression happening in some individuals? Because there are differences in the aggression levels of people, okay? Studies show that there's little to no relationship between aggressiveness and things like self-esteem, uh, playing video games, and mental illness. Um, and they also have found a very small effect of uh, from genetics. All right, so let's talk about this. Uh, let's spe let's specifically focus in first on the the, the one about mental illness. Um, mental illness is showing no relationship um, with aggressiveness, except people who are experiencing mental illness who are also abusing alcohol and substances. Okay, that combination of mental illness and alcohol and substance use makes someone more prone to violence, okay? There are additional factors that are associated with a tendency toward violent behavior. Keep in mind, associations are correlations. It is not cause and effect, okay? So, for example, growing up in a violent neighborhood, that will not be a cause of violent behavior, but it, it is associated with or correlated with a tendency, tendency toward violent behavior. Uh, having parents with a history of antisocial behavior. Having a mother who smoked cigarettes or drank alcohol during her pregnancy. Having exposure um, to toxic chemicals or early in life poor nutrition. Head injuries, okay, having a history of a head injury. 
not feeling guilty after hurting someone is, is a tendency toward violent behavior. A weaker than normal sympathetic nervous system response where the nervous system does not respond in the proper way to maybe feeling something like empathy or sympathy rather than aggression. Um, high levels of testosterone coupled with low levels of cortisol, which we've talked about in the last chapter. And then a history of suicide attempts is often associated with a tendency toward violent behavior. Now, um, besides the individual factors that we just talked about um, on aggression, there are actually cognitive influences, things that from a cognitive standpoint can have an effect on violence and actually um, influence it. People sometimes justify what they call cruel or uncooperative behaviors by lowering the opinion of the victims. What that means is they don't look at the people that they are um, exerting violence or aggression on as people. Okay, and there's two different terms for that. One is the de-individualization, which is perceiving others as anonymous, that these aren't like real people who are just like me, okay? Or dehumanization is where we perceive someone else as less than human, okay? So we don't, we don't see people that we are victimizing as humans or like me, in a sense, so that we feel like we can be aggressive towards them because they're not like us. They may not even be human. All right. People also decrease their own sense of personal responsibility where they will say something like, it's not me. I'm doing this as part of a group. Okay. So I can be violent because I'm part of a group, let's say, um, in the military, I'm a soldier on duty. Okay, so I'm part of this group, so that decreases my own sense of personal responsibility, because as the group, that's what we have to do, is be aggressive in wartime, let's say, as part of our job. Um, and a more simplistic example is, we often hide behind a mask of some sort, and that mask could be something simple like, you know, you put on a pair of sunglasses, and you get this feeling that, okay, I'm not really personally responsible anymore for you know, um, cruel, uncooperative behavior, possibly violence, because I'm hiding behind something. I'm hiding behind this idea that, you know, you know, it's okay that I do it because whoever, again, I'm being violent toward is, is not a human or is not like me. Okay. Um, another example of violence or an aggressive behavior is known as sexual aggression. This is the area of rape, which is, um, sexual activity without the consent of a partner. And there are some characteristics that we have found of rapists, and that is um, hostility. They are often distrustful of others. There's always a history of other acts of violence. They are high users of pornography, um, and more specifically, violent pornography. And they have a extreme self-centeredness you know, about themselves, where they, they don't see anything outside themselves, you know, and their own being, all right? In the second section of this chapter, we're talking mainly about social perception and cognition. What this has to do with is learning about others um, and making inferences from that information. This kind of thing influences our observations of other people. It influences our memory of things and how we think about things, all right? So it's, it's kind of more about the thinking aspect um, and not the physical violence and aggression that we were just talking about in the prior section, okay? So the information that we get through these observations of people um, is, are known as first impressions, Primacy effect. Primacy has a meaning of first, okay? And the tendency for this first information we learn about someone um, influences us more than anything we learn later on, 
Okay, we form these first impressions very quickly, and they're actually more accurate than we might guess. You know, and everyone have said, oh, my first impression of that person is this. Well, yeah, yes, they're, they're actually quite accurate, those first impressions that we form, all right? Um, then we have something called self-fulfilling prophecies, which are expectations that increase how um, something or how often or how possible it is for the predicted event to occur. All right, so let me give you an example. If a psychologist hands you a phone, a phone to talk to someone, then shows you a picture of the person, even though the, the person on the other end of the phone line doesn't actually know that this is happening. They're just on the other end of the phone line. Um, if the picture of the person that you are shown uh, by the psychologist is an attractive person, you will tend, based on your first impression or the primacy effect, to kind of act friendlier um, toward that person who's on the other end of the phone, who doesn't know what's actually you know, going on in this experiment. And then as a result of you acting friendlier, the person on the other end of the phone is actually going to be quite cheerful um, back to you, okay? And it's all because you had this expectation based on the photo you saw of that person and your first impression that, oh, you know, based on their looks, because they're attractive, right, um, I'm going to be friendlier toward them because they're probably a nice person. That's the idea behind first impressions, okay? So something to think about. Um, our observations of people and the inferences that we make about them lead to us have cognitively kind of thinking about and coming up with some stereotypes and prejudices. Now let's look at these definitions and talk about it a bit more. Um, a stereotype is a belief. That's the key word here that you might want to circle. It's a belief or an expectation about a group of people, whereas a prejudice is an unfavorable attitude. So the difference, and important to note, is belief versus attitude toward a group of people, okay? And then discrimination is unequal treatment. So the key words are, you know, stereotype being a belief, okay? Prejudice being an attitude, and discrimination being a treatment, okay? An actual action, all right? Um, some stereotypes are actually not wrong. Let's think about an example. Who do you think gets into more fist fights on average, let's just say? Men or women? Well, if you said men, you would be correct. That is a stereotype. However, it's also... Um, not a wrong stereotype because we can actually, you know, kind of prove that stereotype by getting some some data on who gets into fist fights more. So it's it's interesting, you know, to think about stereotypes and prejudices. Just keep the differences um, clear in your head. Belief versus attitude versus treatment. Okay. There are some ways that researchers can measure what we call subtle prejudices. Subtle prejudices being things that people do not want to admit, okay? And the way researchers do this are through implicit measures. And one test is called the implicit association test. This is a procedure that measures reactions. By reactions, we mean how quickly or how slowly people react to combinations of categories, um, such as flowers and pleasant. When you think of the word flowers and pleasant together, you should have a relatively quick kind of positive reaction to them because they're two really positive words and we can see them actually going together, all right? The, this implicit test finds evidence of this subtle or hint of prejudice um, even among people who say they don't have any prejudice ideas, okay? Um, the thing is, is that most people are aware of their prejudices, even if they don't like to admit them. So those that are saying they don't have any, um, many people do. They are aware of them, but they don't like to admit um, that they have them. That's where the denial comes in. So there's a very interesting piece in the textbook on this that actually describes the implicit test, and it uses um, 
these keys, left and right keys, and it builds from step to step. So let me see if I could explain it as best I could, is that um, you're asked to press a, a, a left key, like with your left hand, for an unpleasant word that you see on the computer screen. And then you're also asked to press a right key if you see a pleasant word on the screen. That's kind of stage one of that um, test. Then the instructions change. And they say, okay, press a left key if you see the name of an insect, like a, you know, a roach or an ant, come up on the screen. And then you can press the right key if you see the name of a flower come up on the screen. Okay. Then the instructions change again to the next stage where they say, okay, press a left key um, if you see something unpleasant or an insect and press a right key if you see something pleasant or a flower on the screen some sort of flower okay then notice that so they paired them up from the first two stages and then they will switch the pairings which make it a bit more difficult and may slow down the reaction because remember this test measures reactions to combinations of things that show maybe some prejudice all right so when they switch the pairings it would be okay press the left key if you see something unpleasant you know or a type of flower you know or press the right key if you see something pleasant or an insect usually we don't associate an insect you know with being pleasant or we don't associate a kind of flower, any flower, with being unpleasant. Okay, so it's, it switches things up, and oftentimes people have to kind of give it a little bit more thought, and it may slow down their reaction, and that's what this test aims to get at, is measuring reaction, slow speed, slow or speedy, okay, to these questions, to these combinations of things, all right? How can we actually overcome prejudice? Well, increasing contact among People who are different helps a bit, but people who work together in doing something that brings them together and they're working toward a common goal of some sort. In this picture, it is, I would assume, to clean up garbage around the neighborhood. Um, they can overcome prejudices that initially um, separate them. So this is just a good example of, um, you know, having a common goal, all right? One way of decreasing prejudice is by increasing acceptance. Well, what does that mean and, and exactly how, all right? When we think of acceptance, we think of a goal of treating everyone the same, um, but that sometimes backfires because it implies that everyone should act the same. We kind of can't really think this way um, because that's not what it really means. Treating everyone the same, um, implying that everyone should act the same, that's not what we're saying when we're talking about decreasing prejudice. So instead of thinking that way, we have to think more along the lines of what we call multiculturalism which is where we accept that there are differences among people. We recognize that there are differences among people. And more importantly, we enjoy the differences among people and groups. And we, we kind of say, okay, each group or each individual has these unique contributions. And we should look at that as a plus for everyone. All right, that, that's one of the ways to look at it. Not that we want to make everybody the same, but that we are all very different, okay? And that's, you know, accepting, recognizing, and enjoying these differences is what's going to make the difference for um, decreasing prejudice by increasing acceptance, okay? Um, okay, so we've talked about aggressive behavior. Uh, we've talked about, um, you know, cognitive aspects of our thoughts related to prejudice and stereotypes. Um, how else can we explain people's behaviors? Meaning, when people behave in certain ways, why do they do that? Okay, what do we attribute behaviors to? These are known as attributions. This is 
the set of thought processes that we use in our heads, we think about, to assign what has caused our behavior um, and what has caused the behavior of others. And there's two kinds of attributions, internal versus external. When we talk about internal contributions, we're talking about things that are part of our personality, our um, you know, internal abilities and other characteristics, our, our personal attitudes. They're more like our disposition. What kind of disposition do we have? Let me give you an example. My brother walks to work because he likes to exercise. Okay, so I'm attributing um, his walking to work based on his internal um, attitude of he just likes to exercise. All right, that's an internal attribution. An external attribution is more situational. We explain things based on a situation um, and it becomes something that is outside of ourselves because the situation is occurring outside of ourselves. So let's look at an example. Um, same thing with my brother walking to work, but this time my brother walks to work because his car wouldn't start. Okay. His car not starting is an external attribution. So it's important to, you know, remember that internally he likes to exercise. So if he walks to work because he likes to exercise, that's internal. Whereas if he walks to work because his car wouldn't start, we're attributing that behavior, you know, to the external situation of, okay, my car's not working. All right. That's the difference. All right. Um, we also, we kind of make this distinction between internal and external based on a few things, meaning we try to explain a person's behavior based on one of these three ways down here at the bottom. Okay. The first way is how a person's behavior kind of compares with other people's behavior. Okay. If a behavior you see is kind of unusual, you really look for the explanation of that behavior to be like an internal thing, like someone's personality. Like they are doing something really kind of different than the rest of us because their personality is causing that difference, their inner personality, internal, okay? Then we have the second one known as consistency. How, it, how does this person's behavior change um, or vary from one time to the next? So for example, if someone is always friendly, that's kind of an internal trait. But if they are friendly in one case or in one situation, and let's say it changes um, in a different situation, then it's kind of an external thing, okay? Because technically, they're always a friendly person. It's an internal trait of theirs. But again, if they're friendly to me in one situation, but then not in not in another situation, they're not a friendly person. That is is based on this situation, okay? And then this idea of distinctiveness is, you know, if someone's pleasant, let's say to everyone but one person, you know, you would assume that the one person maybe did something to annoy the person who is now not pleasant to them. Okay, so their behavior varies, you know, you know, from one situation to another. These are just kind of three ways that we try to explain why a person's behaving the way they do and, you know, their attributions, all right? Um, there are additional things that, terms and, and concepts that are about attributions to explain behavior. Let's look at them. One is called the actor-observer effect. The actor-observer effect is where we have a tendency to, to be more likely to make our internal attributions for other people's behaviors um, and to be more likely to make external attributions for our own behavior. So it's better to give you an example on this one. For example, if there's a person shouting at a sales clerk, let's say in a store, and you're watching this, you would say that that person who's shouting is a loud mouth. You would kind of be like, oh my God, look at that person. What a loud mouth, okay? Um, so we're attributing something internally about that person to explain their behavior and why they're shouting. However, if you were to shout at, at a sales clerk, you would say, well, I shouted like that because I was treated unfairly. 
which is an external attribution. It's not my personality. It's just something I was treated unfairly externally. And that's why I'm actually shouting. So I, I use an external attribution that I was treated unfairly to explain my own behavior of shouting. Whereas if I'm watching someone else shout, I would explain that they're shouting just because they're a loud mouth. That's an internal attribution. Okay. Then we have something called the fundamental attribution error. And this is where we tend to focus a blame on the person's disposition, meaning they're a bad person, instead of blaming the situation, that it's just a bad situation and that's why they're behaving the way they are. So we kind of make this error by, you know, blaming it on the person and internally what their, you know, disposition is. Versus blaming it on the outside or external situation. <clears throat> so just something to think about there, what we blame it on. All right. In addition, we have some other aspects of attributions to keep in mind. And um, related to that fundamental attribution error from the first uh, the slide right before this, are that there are some cultural differences in attribution and other related matters. Okay. And this has to do with... <coughs> cultures, people in Asian cultures um, are less likely than those in Western cultures to attribute behavior to consistent personality traits and more to the situation. So what this actually means is that uh, people in Asian cultures um, usually attribute behaviors in situations to the situation, okay? Whereas in Western cultures, like the United States, we tend to attribute behavior and things that people do to their internal traits, what kind of person they are, um, you know, what their um, disposition is, that kind of thing, okay? In addition, um, we tend to use attributions to, you know, manage how we see ourselves, okay? what we want our perception to be of ourselves. Of course, we want to perceive ourselves in a favorable light, in a positive light. And so what we'll do is we will use attributions or we will attribute our behaviors to things that will make us look good to ourselves. One of these is called the self-serving biases. And with these, um, we kind of attribute um, we minimize our the blame that we take for any failures that we experience um, and we maximize you know the credit that we take for success okay obviously who doesn't want to take credit for being successful um, and and you know make that a really strong case and of course, who doesn't want to minimize blame? Who doesn't want to blame themselves for the failure? Then, you know, we want to look favorable. So we don't want to kind of say, yes, you know, um, it was all my fault. That wouldn't make us look favorable. Okay, so to have a more positive perception of ourselves, we're going to attribute um, that, you know, our success to certain things that we did. Okay, and that's why we were successful. All right. Another thing that we do, you know, when we want our perception of ourselves to be favorable is we sometimes implement what we call self-handicapping strategies. These are things that are going to put us at a disadvantage for getting something done or accomplishing something. And then that becomes our excuse for why we failed. So basically, um, we do something to take the blame off ourselves for this failure. Um, so think about if we um, are taking a test. We don't study enough, and we go to a party the night before, and then we get a poor or low grade on the test. Well, one of the self-handicapping strategies will say, okay, I'm going to blame the party the night before because I was tired the next day for the test instead of blaming you know which takes the pressure off us because you know it's not my fault right that's an excuse for my failure instead of blaming the I didn't really study enough thing okay so 
a lot of times people do this kind of self-handicapping. They procrastinate. Okay, that's a self-handicapping strategy. They'll take on too many things so that if they fail at them, that will be um, the reason is, oh, I had too many things on my plate to actually succeed. So that's what I'm going to blame it on. And then it kind of protects um, our feeling of ourselves, our perception of ourselves. Okay, so we're going to use an attribution, um, you know, towards something else instead of, you know, truly blaming ourselves for why we, let's say, failed something, okay? Um, now, we're in the third section of this chapter, and now that we have figured out why people behave the way they do, um, can we change those behaviors? That's what we're going to look to do here. Maybe, but maybe we must change the attitudes first, and the answer is not necessarily. So, like, this is a connection between attitudes and behaviors, all right? Are we trying to change behavior first or attitudes first? Which one has to be changed first in order for the behavior of people to be changed, okay? So, the definition of an attitude is a like or dislike of something that influences behavior. This includes our emotions, number one, how you feel about something. It includes cognitive aspects, meaning what do you know or believe about something. And it also includes behavior. Um, number three, what are you likely to do? Okay. So when we talk about measuring attitudes, you know, as psychologists, you know, many of them try to measure things. We've talked about this throughout our semester is people tend to report their attitudes um, through these usually um questionnaires and they're often what we call a Likert scale question where it's like put your answer from a scale of one to five, one being, you know, strongly agree and five being disagree or, you know, switched. Um, but the people reporting their attitudes don't always match what their behaviors are. So what they're saying that they like or dislike doesn't always match what they're doing. Okay. So there's this idea of, well, you know, how do I change maybe my attitude towards something, which then may in turn change my behavior? And the idea comes from this concept called cognitive dissonance. Think back to Piaget again. We talked about equilibrium and disequilibrium. Do you remember that? Where it's, you know, you're learning something in Piaget's theory and you have information already that you know and you're trying to fit it into something you already know. But you can't. So you get this uncomfortable kind of feeling when you can't connect some new information to something you already know. This is a similar principle called cognitive dissonance, is where we have this kind of feeling of unpleasant tension um, when our attitudes, um, you know, and, you know, or our behavior kind of goes against or goes in the opposite way of what we're saying our attitude is, especially if it bothers us, okay? So, for example, if you are um, asked to tell a lie and you're given $20 to do it, most people are usually fine with that and have no conflict about it because they're being given that $20, which is a decent amount of money, okay? However, if you are asked to tell a lie and you're only given a dollar, you kind of like give it a second thought, right? Like, well, only for a dollar, oh, that's kind of like this unpleasant tension, it, you know, rising in me um, because it's like only a dollar. Do I really want to lie for only a dollar? So, um, you know, I may change my attitude now about lying where I'm not, I don't want to lie just for a dollar. OK, because I'm changing my attitude now to get rid of that unpleasant tension that I'm feeling. That's what cognitive dissonance refers to. OK, um, and there's a couple of ways of looking at this changing of attitudes, um, you know, and, and how how do we go about changing our attitudes? That's kind of what we're talking about on these next few slides. And it's all about persuasion. OK, um, are others persuading us? Are outside factors persuading us? Are we persuading ourselves? These are the kinds of mechanisms that we're looking at. There's a couple of routes to think about here. The first one is called the peripheral route to persuasion. Um, and this is based on emotion. 
where there's superficial factors such as, you know, someone says the same thing over and over, or the person who's actually speaking that we're listening to is a very important person. So, you know, emotionally we make a connection and that's how we get persuaded. Okay. A good example is, um, if you're house hunting, you're looking at houses and you seem to like one house over another. And the reason is because the day that you saw that house, it was a lot nicer weather. You're dealing from more of an emotional route, okay, this peripheral route, because it was a beautiful day, you know, maybe you were feeling happy and cheerful that day, and so you like that particular house better that you saw that day, clearly based on emotion. Then you have what's called the central route to persuasion, which is less about emotion and more about thought and analysis. It's the process where people take a decision seriously. They, they spend time thinking about it. They spend time looking at the evidence and reasoning through it. Okay. So going back to the house example, um, instead of just picking that house from the emotional standpoint, cause it was a beautiful day, you saw it, it looked great in the sun and you, you were basing it on emotion in the central route you're basing it more on the worth of the house. You choose which house you like because you've looked at all the aspects of it. You know, is it worth this? You know, what kind of quality is it? And what neighborhood? You go through all that. And that's more of this central route to persuasion based more on logical reasoning and decision making and evaluating things. Okay. Um, there's the next couple of slides really talk about a number of, um, what we call special techniques and ways to persuade people. And these really are all part of what we call the, that peripheral route because they're made to manipulate our emotions so that we can then change our attitude towards something. Okay. So the first one called liking and similarity is where someone you like or consider similar to yourself is usually more persuasive than other people. So for example, if you see a picture um, of a light bulb and it has a face on it with a, with a saying, you know, in quotes, please turn me off, you know, you kind of um, are more persuaded to actually turn off that light because it relates to you because you're seeing the, the picture of a face on the light bulb. And when you see faces, you think of someone like yourself. Okay. Um, the second one's called social norms. And this is where you, you're being told that most people favor some idea or action, and that's what makes it appealing. So, for example, um, when there's a tip jar on the counter in, let's say, a restaurant or anywhere that you go in and buy a service or buy, uh, buy goods, and there's actually money in the tip jar, well, you assume that, oh, well, others have actually put money in that tip jar already because there's money in there. So I should as well. That's what social norms mean. And then reciprocation is where you feel obligated to perform a favor for someone who did a favor for you. So, okay, I owe you one. Someone did something for you and you say back to them, oh, I owe you one. You know, that's an emotional um, technique of persuasion. And then there's something called this contrast effect where it something appears, you know, more desirable because, you know, it's contrasted to something else. So, for example... You're eating at a restaurant, there's a menu, and the prices are really high of the items on the menu. But instead of, um, you know, ordering the first, the highest price item, you order the second highest just because when you compare it to the highest, it's not the highest, it's the second highest, okay? So you compare it to something else, and that's what changes your attitude to make that decision, all right? Additional techniques of persuasion related to that emotional pull is called the foot in the door technique. And it's where, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, get somebody to do something by asking them a little bit uh, to do a little something, um, which gets accepted and then asking them to do more. Okay. So for example, we ask people to fill out, let's say a 20 minute survey first, and then a month later we ask them to fill out a 40 minute survey and most of them actually will. Okay, based on this technique. Then there's another technique called a bait and switch. I'm sure some of you have probably heard that saying and not knew exactly what it meant, but here's what it means. Okay, um, it's where, you know, we get people to do something or buy something because it looks like, you know, a really good deal. Um, and then we get them to commit to the deal, but then we say, oh, no, there's more to it. Okay, and we'll give you an example. Someone says, okay, you can buy this item for this amount and then you as the person go and want to buy the item or try to buy the item and then the company says oops now we're out of that item how about we give you a substitute and so they've switched it to something else now okay then we have the that's not all technique 
um, where we're trying to get someone to do something where we make them an offer and then before the person can commit to, you know, buying it, we add something to it to try to improve the offer, okay, before you even have a chance to, you know, answer. So, for example, when there's a TV commercial that says, buy this for nineteen ninety five. And then, but wait, there's more. And they go into giving you more, you know, and it's that kind of thing. So um, that's not all. And then, oops, sorry. Then there's these fear messages, which messages that appeal um, to, you know, the fear of something, they're sometimes effective, but unless it's, um, you know, unless the message is too extreme or it suggests that something is hopeless, it, it doesn't work that well. So, um, for example, if there's a an ad that says, oh, every day 100 dolphins will die unless you act now. Please send money, you know, for the Save the Dolphins Fund. Well, again, our fear is we don't want 800 dolphins to die. But again, if the message becomes too extreme or we feel that it's, you know, it's hopeless, even if, you know, we do act, then it's fear messages are not as effective as a technique of persuasion. Okay, you know, persuasion of our emotions. All right. Other ways that we can change an attitude or behavior is from what we call delayed influence. There are a couple of things to remember here. There are two ways, two, two things called delayed influence. The first one is called the sleeper effect. Um, it's when we reject something that someone's telling us um, because we, we don't really think too much or too highly of the person who kind of proposed whatever they're asking us to do, okay? Um, or you know, we forget where we heard, because, you know, they sometimes forget where they heard the idea and later come to accept it. It's kind of this um, delayed persuasion because you initially rejected something. And then later on, if you hear it again, you know, you might actually, you know, have an attitude change toward it. But initially, you rejected it. Okay. There's another part piece to delayed influence, another example called the minority influence. Um, and it says, although minority may have little influence at first, it can, um, through kind of saying, a, you know, a message over and over and over again, repeating it, eventually persuade others to adopt that position. So it's almost like you hear something once and you're like, ah, I'm not going to really be influenced by that. I'm not going to change my attitude about something as a result of that. Okay. But then you keep hearing it over and over as if you see the same commercial every single time when you're watching a show, you see the commercial 25 times for something, then you may actually, um, eventually after hearing it 25 times change your attitude or behavior as a result of this delayed kind of influence. Okay. Um, in addition, people are actually more influenced to change their behaviors or their attitudes at certain times than at other times. All right. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind here. There are, there are lots of this, this can happen. Um, and this, inc this includes something called the forewarning effect. This is where, um, if we actually warn people that they're about to hear um, some sort of persuasive speech, they automatically start putting up their resistance. Um, so think about when, you know, you're asked to attend like a, you know, a seminar for buying like a timeshare, right? You already, you're already forewarned. You know that that's what they're going to try to do right, is persuade you to buy this. So you kind of put up your defenses a little bit and, and your caution kind of kicks in like, okay, I can't just jump right in and buy this. All right. And then another um, example of this is called the inoculation effect. This is where people are, are less persuaded by an argument because, you know, they first heard a weaker argument. Okay. So someone gives you an argument for something which is pretty weak. Um, it's, it's, it, doesn't really convince you of anything, but then, then they, you know, give you the strong argument of, about it. You're actually persuaded less. It would have been better if they gave you the strong argument than the weak argument. And compare this one just from the name inoculation to think vaccine. Okay. Where, you know, you get a weak version of the virus when you get a vaccine, a vaccination, right? A vaccine for any, anything that you'd get a vaccine for. It's a weak version of the virus. It helps you to build up immunity to then fight off the stronger version of the virus. So use that as a, a, an analogy to this inoculation effect of persuasive arguments. And that is, you know, um, you know, someone who gives you the weak version first 
it helps us to kind of build up, oh, I'm not interested. I'm not going to change my attitude or be persuaded by that. So that when they give you the stronger argument, you have a good resistance to it, something to think, think about. Okay. So a lot of those, um, you know, techniques of persuasion are not that they're, they're generally pleasant ways of doing it. And then there are some unpleasant forms of persuasion. Okay. And these are known as coercive techniques. And these techniques, um, try to increase, you know, confessions of people who are both guilty and innocent. Um, and when we use coercive persuasion, you know, the confessions that we get, you know, um, can't really be reliable. We, we don't get reliable evidence from persuading people to confess to something um, because they could be just confessing because of the coercion. And a lot of the cases here involve the military or the police interrogators who use um, torture, often psychological torture, to get someone to, um, you know, persuade them to confess, okay? All right, another section, uh, another topic in this chapter on social psychology is how individuals establish relationships with others, okay? Remember, the main topic of this chapter is social psychology. So this happens in a variety of ways. Uh, one way is through proximity. Well, we become friends with people who we have freaking frequent contact with. So those who live near us, those who we work with, okay? We also become... Um, you know, we can possibly establish a relationship with someone just by mere exposure to them, okay? If we come into contact with someone or something, we tend to like that person or object, all right? Um, however, just just becoming familiar with them does not always increase our liking of that person, all right? That's important to know. And then um, a third way that this could happen to establish relationships is physical, attractive, physical attractiveness. This um, is you know, usually most important for the first hour after meeting someone, okay? However, it, it's, it's used as a cue to someone's health and therefore if they're desirable as a mate. And um, sometimes we actually use approximations of their features as attractive. Like usually average features are attractive to most people um, because average features tend to be associated with, you know, um, a person who can be a mate for breeding. All right. Um, there are more ways that we can establish relationships with people. Similarity is another one. All right. When in the early stages of romantic attraction, you know, the appearance of someone physically is key. But as time goes on, um, how similar we are in interests and goals becomes actually more important. Okay. And then another uh, way we can establish relationships with people is through the equity principle. It's this exchange theory um, where social relationships are actually transactions in which partners exchange goods and services. All right. So if someone is equal, if you have a, two people who are equally attractive and intelligent, you know, they also want to be able to contribute equally to things like the chores, um, you know, in the household or the finances and how they each um, provide equal amounts of those things, okay? Relationships most likely thrive when the, each person in that relationship believes that they're getting a, as good of a deal or as fair of a deal as the other person, such as we're 50-50 in doing chores, we're 50-50 in the amount of, you know, money we are contributing to our partnership and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, another way, recent way that we can establish relationships with people is through modern technology and dating. The internet has added a whole new dimension to dating. Um, but there are some concerns with, you know, honesty, with are we using superficial criteria um, when we're using internet dating sites? Um, you know, are we basing it just on the attractiveness of the photos? Those kinds of things, okay? Um, in addition to establishing relationships, when relationships get to the point of marriage and long-term commitments, you know, what's the idea behind marriages? Well, um, marriages and similar relationships often, you know, don't last because there were problems from the very beginning. There were displays of anger early on in the relationship, okay? And we found that some of the best predictors of, you know, long-term satisfaction um, is when people have a genuine affection for each other. And, you know, you also have a genuine pleasure for 
your the success of your spouse. You really, you know, feel like, um, you know, that was really important and you support them and really get enjoyment out of seeing someone else be successful. That's been one of the best predictors of long-term satisfaction, okay? Psychologists have also maintained that romantic relationships begin with what we call passionate love, where there is um, romance, sexual desire, and friendship kind of all increase in parallel at the same time and in the same um, way. And then gradually over many years develops into what we call companionate love, which is a stage in a relationship where there's sharing, caring, the protective kind of feeling, okay? And that's what happens over time, all right? Um, this is, you know, for some, for some couples, the idea of love fades, but for many of them, um, it remains strong and passionate even, you know, even after many, many years of being married, okay? All right, um, now that we have looked at people's behaviors, attitudes, and relationships, how else, you know, are people influenced? How else are their behaviors influenced? Well, their behaviors are influenced by social outside influences, okay? By um, setting norms and offering information. What this means is we watch how others dress, let's just say, and we watch how others act, and then we tend to do the same. Okay, so it's this social outside influence. Um, we also uh, follow the examples of others just because they did some sort of action and we kind of think, okay, well, maybe we should be doing that too, you know, kind of the monkey see, monkey do. But we also kind of think about, well, why did they do that? So, for example, if we see a, a crowd of people running from a building, we run too because we kind of think in our head, well, something must actually be wrong if all these people are running from the building, all right? Um, that's one example here. Another example is kind of without too much thought, sometimes it's more of a reflex or a reaction, is someone yawns, then you yawn too as well, okay? So it's interesting, all right? Um, so this social influence, is, social influence also um, can change the behavior of someone, all right? Um, in addition to this social influence having to do with, um, you know, changing others, this idea of conformity goes with the idea of social influence, is where we change our behavior to match what other people are doing, their behavior, or what they expect, okay? So a good example of this is driving, all right? When we are driving, um, our cars, if everyone is driving in the same direction on the same side of the road, that's actually a good thing to be conforming to, okay, to, to have conformity, because if we don't do that, then there would be a lot more car accidents if people were just driving in every which direction, okay. Um, there's something called conformity to an obviously wrong majority, and there is um, an experiment in the book that talks about ash, Ash's experiment had to do with these, these bars or lines that were drawn up and down. And people were shown one line drawn up and down, and then they were shown three other lines and asked which of those three lines was the same height as the first line. Well, um, many of the individuals picked the same line just because they saw other people picking it, they were conforming, okay, when that was not the correct answer, okay? So what this is saying is that, you know, people are likely to conform to a group of three um, as a small group as well as to a larger group, you know, when they see them answering in a certain way, okay? But if there were to be someone who picked a different line, than all the other people, then we might say, hey, they're like, an, they seem to be picking something else. Maybe it could be that answer too, okay? Um, there's also variations in how often people conform to certain things based on their cultures, all right? Um, sometimes, though, we overgeneralize and we place certain cultures into this idea of, well, all Asian cultures, for example, are collectivist, meaning they they kind of conform as a whole. Nobody thinks, you know, for themselves. And that's an overgeneralization. We can't necessarily do that. Um, but we also do see 
it tend to happen. And we often see Western cultures like the United States or other Western cultures encouraging indiv uh, individuality and originality instead of conformity. All right. So that's something just to think about. Um, other ideas related to conformity have to do with um, how obedient are we are to authority figures, okay? Meaning, to what extent would you hurt someone if you were ordered to? And there were there were two very interesting experiments done here. One is called um, the prison experiments. Um, Philip Zimbardo and his colleagues in the early 1970s, this is one of the best known um, studies in social psychology. It's where they paid and randomly assigned college students at Stanford University to play the roles of guards and prisoners. And what they were having them do was um, they, they had some of them act as the guards where they were given power over the prisoners and they were told to, you know, um, bully them, basically. And what happened was is within six days of the study, the researchers actually had to cancel it because many of the guards who were told by the researchers to physically and emotionally bully the prisoners um, were doing that. And when they told them to, you know, get really physical, you know, with them and, and emotionally abuse them and bully them, um, they did. They took it up a notch. So the idea behind this was that when given power over others, you know, the, the researchers gave the guards who were part of the study this power over, they, they actually abused their power. Okay, so again, they conformed to what they were being told to do, even if it may have been something that they necessarily didn't agree with. They were told to do it and then they obeyed, okay, to the authority figures and became, um, you know, more, more bully. They bullied them more, okay. Then there was a second experiment by Stanley Milgram who conducted this experiment to find out if normal people would follow orders that might hurt someone as well. And in this experiment, there was a teacher who was an actually a, a real participant, unaware of the study. And the teacher was asked to deliver kind of these shocks, which by the way, were not real shocks, but the, the teacher who was the participant who was unaware of what was going on in the study um, didn't know that these shocks were not real shocks, okay? And then there was the learners who were actually part of the experimental team. They knew what was going on in this. They had to make mistakes. And the teacher then was supposed to deliver a shock every time the learner made a mistake, okay? Um, and what was happening was the teachers who did not know what was going on in the study continued to deliver these shocks, um, to these learners. And then they were asked to turn up the level of the shock, the voltage that they were using in these shock things to, uh, based on the number of, you know, kinds of mistakes as, as the learners were making mistakes. So the teachers were told to do this. They were not aware of what the research study was about. And they actually followed the orders by continuing to deliver these shocks. Now, of course, the individuals in this experiment were in separate rooms, so the teacher did not actually see the reaction of the learners who were being, quote unquote, shocked, even though there were no real shocks being delivered. But they, they thought they were shocking them, right? And they kept doing it. Um, however, that changed a little bit when they actually were able to see them or be in the same room with them. Then they kind of felt um, almost bad that they were shocking them and their obedience to the authority figures telling them to shock them kind of weakened a bit. So it was a very, very interesting um, experiment, these particular two experiments. You should read more about them in the textbook, okay? And then the last and final piece of all of this uh, discussion of social psychology, influences on behavior, attitude changes, um, all this kind of thing, is has to do with group decision making and how organizations tend to set up groups that make decisions um, and consider issues because decisions made by groups are generally better than individual decisions, but it often really depends on the circumstances. Sometimes groups interact in what we call unfavorable ways, <coughs> excuse me, to keep people from you know, giving a dissenting opinion. There's two terms here. Group 
polarization has to do with if you're an individual, <coughs> you have an opinion on something. You're now in a group who has, uh, you know, with people who have a more extreme uh, opinion on the position you're trying to take. After being in that group, you now tend to have stronger feelings and opinions on that topic that you didn't have before, all because you were influenced by the individuals in that group with more extreme positions. So that's called group polarization. And then group think is where someone, um, group think is where someone is not fully on board with a decision, um, but they don't say anything. Instead, they conform. So this is the idea of conformity, all right, where all of a sudden it's not an individual's ability to think, it's the group's ability to think, there by the name group think, okay? Um, you sort of kind of disagree with the group, but you're not going to say anything because you fear um, that you're going to cause, you know, disruption to the group or you're going to leave a bad impression on them. So then you just conform. Okay. So these two ideas really are, are very interesting when it comes to um, how people are influenced, um, if they want to conform, um, you know, to the group or if their attitude changes a bit based on things that they're hearing within that group, because we've talked about attitude change during this chapter as well, all right? So just some ideas here about group decision-making, all right? So keep in mind that this chapter, all about social psychology, influences on people's behavior, on their attitudes, on, you know, things that they do, um, and what it's based on. Do they attribute it to themselves? Do they attribute it to things outside of them? What are those things they attribute outside and how do you know things in society influence people's not only decision making but their actions all right so very interesting chapter um we'll probably do an activity in class on this and i will see everyone in class